So uh, thank you for uh, attending our session this morning. Uh, one thing, just a quick housekeeping note, if you have a cell phone, if you could either turn it off or set it to silent, uh, we would appreciate that. So uh, thanks for joining this uh, track four session on transitioning to the grid of things with a focus around visibility, communications, analytics, and security. My name is Mike Guilfoyle, and I'm, I'm an analyst for ARC. And that didn't work out how I wanted it to. <laughs> so while, while we're waiting here, uh, just a quick, uh, let me get a quick gauge on the room in terms of how many folks are fairly familiar with how utilities operate and, and are regulated? You guys don't count. <laughs> okay, and, and how many of you come from other industries and, and don't have that level of familiarity? Okay, great. So one of the reasons why I wanted to ask that question is, is uh, I've been speaking on and off this week with uh, Dwayne Bradley of Duke Energy and uh, he's been, I think, fascinated a little bit about uh, as a utility professional coming to an environment like this where you're crossing uh, multiple industries and, and seeing the commonalities that occur within these industries related to uh, really changing to a much more data-driven world and how you can do a lot of learning for things that really don't, uh, you know, they don't affect you in terms of your everyday work process, but they're so similar, you can take what you've learned there and you can transition it into, into uh, you know, your everyday uh, work roles and responsibilities. Um, you know, but some of the topics we've touched on this week around analytics and cybersecurity are extremely relevant across the board. Um, and, you know, certainly in utilities, which is, of course, one of the, the basic infrastructure is one of the basic cornerstones of, of our, our civilization, really. Um, so what I want to do here is, is set the, the tone for um, what, what they're going to discuss, uh, certainly in light of what we heard a few days ago around um, uh, ExxonMobil talking about open automation. Duke Energy is engaged in something fairly sim similar, but from a very different perspective. Uh, in terms of they're a regulated utility uh, that has g distribution, um, trans or pardon me, generation distribution and generation, transmission, it's early, generation, transmission and distribution. Um, and, and essentially, in terms of utilities, they're, they're monopolies. So they have to be regulated in a, in a fairly specific and stringent manner. So their, their approach to interoperability and uh, uh, interconnection is, is very different than maybe a more competitive environment. So you'll see that perspective today. You do have a, you do have a yes, yes. So I wasn't going to get into the nuances of you know, well, wholesale markets and all this. Um, so I've, I've used this yesterday, and I'm going to do it again today, because I think no matter where you are, what industry you're in, this sums up the current state of digital transformation. And it comes from GE Vice Chair Beth Comstock. Get used to living in the in-between. The old is going away and the new has not yet fully emerged. It's uncomfortable and it's chaotic. But it's happening in pretty much every industry right now. That, that's, that, that says it all to me. It's, we're, in a, we're at a transition point where the physical as the center of the universe is diminishing and, and data as the center of the universe is emerging, connected to that physical infrastructure. So let's look at what's so different now uh, versus any other past transition point in industry. You really have this, this uh, issue of the proliferation of smart devices and machines. They're, they're being added to uh, infrastructure, to business processes, uh, to end consumers, and they're all connected or have the capacity connect to, to connect. And they're going to be added, you know, in, in exponential numbers over the coming years. And, and they will continue to connect. And they have massive, massive compute power, down from the smallest object to the largest machine. And they're producing vast amounts of data, 
not just not just uh, you know over uh, you know uh, periods of time, but in real time, continuously. They they have uh, the capacity for people to have ubiquitous access to them at unprecedented speed, so you can get to that information whenever you want, wherever you are, and the cost associated with doing so is plummeting. And all of those factors, those very specific and dynamic factors are being applied to the one constant, which is never changing, that's human behavior. And if you look at it in the context of a utility, it's customer choice. Consumers are demanding from their electric utility providers the same thing they demand from every other consumer experience they have. Choice, what they want, when they want it. Something that's also come up a lot today, geopolitics. Or this week around cybersecurity, where you have, you have bad actors threatening us on, on all sorts of different levels, from individuals to state governments. So you now have all of these factors combining around the same human behaviors that never change. So let's look at, let's look at that in the context of the grid. Well, the grids are the ultimate machines. If you look over here at the infrastructure, this is, this is just from this Department of Energy. This is uh, just from the United States. 7,700 power plants, 200,000 miles of high voltage transmission, which is then stepped down in the 55,000 55, substations to 5.5 million miles of local low voltage distribution. You have more than 3,300 providers serving 135 million customers and the value of that machine is valued is $1 trillion. And to that machine, you're adding more and more devices and smart equipment. You have sensors. Now at the edge, the intersection between the utility and its customers, you have things, distributed energy resources, power supplies like rooftop solar. You're also adding, customers are adding smart grid connected equipment both in businesses and in homes. So as you, you look at a statistic from uh, ARC's addressable market study for IIoT, 200 million connected industrial devices by 2019, all of them which consume energy. Now utilities are looking at these devices and trying to apply to them uh, issue, they're trying to use them to solve issues uh, that are coming at them in a, a intensity uh, and consistency that they've never seen before. So they're actively looking at the grid to solve some of their major problems that they're running into that are occurring all at once. Customer choice, what I mentioned before, people want things in a very different manner when it comes to electrical consumption. They have aging infrastructure, which I think everybody here knows about in their own particular industry. They have a lot of stuff above ground, below ground, and they really don't know the condition of it and they have to figure out how to pay for the replacement of it and making it more intelligent as they do so. Workforce replacement, another common theme this, this uh, week, where they have the same idea. They have an aging workforce and they have to figure out how to not only capture the tribal knowledge in that aging workforce, but retain it and attract new and younger people into their business. They also have their core uh, metrics for, for operations, such as safety and safety, and that's basically, for those of you who don't know, that's the duration of frequency of, of outages, um, in and that's one of the metrics by which they're measure, measured in distribution uh, by the regulators. That happens in the U.S., it also happens everywhere across the globe. Everybody has their own safety, safety uh, measurements. Decarbonization, uh, the world in, uh, is moving just to a, a a uh, less carbonized world. Uh, the, the interesting thing there is if you can see it was uh, 2016, I believe it was, that natural gas surpassed coal for the first time in terms of the highest percentage of, of uh, generation for utilities. That's a tipping point. Uh, there, there won't be any going back from that. Uh, politics aside, um, we're just moving to a, a decarbonized world. And something we've talked about all week long, national security. It's a huge, the, the grid is huge. It connects massive swaths of people. And it has, uh, unfortunately, the weakness of you take down pieces of it and that can cascade. And you can have things like hospitals, prisons, without electricity. 
And that's something as a society we, we can't have. So let's look at what's going on relative to the grid edge, which Dwayne will speak about. And when you look at those factors I just discussed and you, you, apply, you apply it to the, the grid edge, the farthest extension of the distribution grid uh, between uh, the utility and, and its customers, you have to really re-choreograph your processes associated with that grid edge interaction. And that means you're moving from, as you can see on the right-hand side, distributed energy resources that traditionally have had limited or no value to utilities based on their centralized generation, transmission, distribution. See, I got it right that time. Uh, based on that, that, that historic structure that's underpinned by their rate case under which they've operated for 100 plus years, that's changing. DER, in that scenario, the connection of it from the customer, whether it's commercial or residential customer, to the grid was very low priority. So they weren't going to rush around to do it because they really didn't see the, the revenue worth of doing so. Whenever there was an issue with the grid, they simply disconnected that from the grid itself. So disconnect was the default for any particular DER. There was also a lack of low voltage visibility, and this is really important because this, I think, addresses something fundamental that Dwayne's gonna talk about today. Uh, because of that centralized structure I mentioned, the utilities only needed to go, to go so far out into their, into their uh, grid in terms of visibility, typically at the substation, maybe a little bit beyond in terms of transformers, but they really just stopped the tendrils of visibility at some point because they didn't need to. They didn't need to worry about individual points on the grid. So when, when they looked at uh, how they went through their reliability planning, how they looked at capital investment, they just didn't consider those distributed resources, those assets out there as part of their planning process, as part of their investment process, as part of uh, their operational processes such as in rush uh, after an outage. They simply didn't consider them because they never had to. And that's completely changing. Their network models, as I mentioned, they were just incomplete. But now as you move into a world where distributed energy is, is typically in, in many states, California, for example, it's preferred. So it's been regulated so that uh, the, the utility has to give preference to that as a generation resource. So they have to, uh, they have to really rethink how they're gonna approach it. So whether it's uh, consumers making choices, whether it's regulations, and really it's a combination of the two, they're shifting from not caring about to DER to a world where DER are very high value to them. So they're gonna focus their processes. They're gonna have to rethink their processes. Things that they were never fundamentally designed to do, they're going to have to understand and implement and do so very quickly. So they're gonna to have to focus on the speed of connection. Last week I was at a utility conference and two major California utilities. Uh, it was pretty amusing as I'd never heard this before in public. Uh, they were trading uh, essentially bragging rights as to whose interconnection process was faster. That's just something for decades. You, you would never have heard that from a utility before. And now they have a completely different orientation around customer service. And it's much more what we expect as consumers. So when you, you look at those DER, they're very high value. They have to integrate them into their core processes as well, such as outage management. How can they use those resources to restore power faster? How can they shift load from one place to the other when they have to for reliability, or as I mentioned, for outages? So, uh, an interesting dynamic here is how can they plan and support patterns of growth? So as we know, populations, population is growing. And typically, um, utilities would see that, and you can of course correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but you know, typically in the planning process, utilities would see that in terms of how they would have to approach it from a capital investment perspective. Okay, we've got neighborhoods going out there, we have nothing out there, we need to invest to build out there. That's capital investment. It's very, very, you know, very high cost, very resource intensive. 
very complex processes associated with the regulations for building that out. Now, with DER out there and the possibility of people choosing to put DER out there, they could potentially concentrate on programs that incentivize people to put on rooftop solars or build a solar garden or a microgrid. And that's a completely different way of looking at how to support that growth. That's a, that is a change in how they view their business model. One of the things that's also interesting when you get to DER that are you know, generating information typically in real time, all the time, uh, if, you're, if you're looking at it in terms of, of uh, load shifting, outage management, you have to be able to dynamically adjust load on a grid. That's a very different orientation verse, versus flipping on a light in terms of how they have to understand the data, how they have to understand the data at both an individual basis and an aggregated basis across their grid. And really it's also about understanding that they're serving new segments of customers, customers that, whose profiles they've never seen before because they're making energy consumption choices for the first time, but they will do that from now on. So that's really where they're moving from don't care to really important. And they're looking at data to help them solve that. So let's look at that a little more, in a little more uh, specific manner around uh, the edge connection process. So interconnection, this is the process of adding a DER, whether it's rooftop, solar, microgrid, whatever, to uh, the distribution grid. So this is something that, that would be a, you know, a utility process. Perhaps it's a third party, um, you know, rooftop solar uh, company. Um, you know, perhaps it's something unique like what Duke has done in Maryland with uh, a microgrid as a service, a lot of different ways to do this. But again, the interconnection process itself fundamentally changes. How you have to think about it changes. Utilities are great at connecting things. There's nobody better. That is a core competency. And there is, I would, I would, there's no, you couldn't find a, an example of uh, you know, an industry where they're really good at connecting really complicated things because that's what they do. However, when you, you put in a, a dynamics that you've never seen around how people that you've, you, you've interacted with the same way for 100 years now wanna do things differently, you have to really reconsider that entire process. So it starts with things like self-service. I wanna, you have to support things like self-service where I'm gonna put a map out there, you can go quickly click on it, determine if you can install DER in your particular location and get that work order going relative to the utility and their processes for getting it approved for interconnection. You have to look at, uh, to support that, the utility has to look at, to, to speed that process, automated and predefined workflows in ways that they've never looked at it before. So no longer can they say, we'll get to that in three weeks. That's just not gonna work for them anymore. They also have to look at systems differently. And we'll look at uh, uh, one instance in particular. They have to consider DER, so utilities own their assets. That's how they've always been able to build a rate case and create revenue. When you look at a DER, that's not an asset they own in many instances. So they have to consider processes, typical traditional processes for assets they've never owned before. And work and asset management systems are a good example of that. So they have to eventually, they will have to extend out into the grid edge things like asset management systems where they have a specific registry for that DER and they have to incorporate that registry, that, that DER asset via that registry into their centralized asset management system. It's a very different orientation for them. They'll have to, of course, deal with audits and compliance, compliance in a very new and different way as this grid edge can, continues to build out. They'll have to look at operations and, and performance associated with that grid edge very differently. So that'll be a, a new way of processing whether they're doing things well or poorly, where they need to improve. They're gonna have to, of course, dynamically manage the grid edge. And that's very resource and process intensive. They're going to have to deal with uh, third-party services in ways that they have never considered yet. 
they've dealt with third party party services for a while, but not the level. If you look at uh, an example in New York, uh, they're building what's called a transactive energy, their transactive energy platform. And, and that is essentially the, the utility as an enabler of third party services, where they can, third party services can provide programs that are much more value based for consumers. That's what the utility has to support. They've never done that before. Again, something I mentioned uh, in terms of aggregation, load shifting, and islanding. The concept that they have to look at DER. Think about how many people there are in the world connected to a grid, just in the US alone. They have to think about anybody that puts a D DER into the grid. They have to look at that as an individual asset that they have to manage based on the cu customer's choices, particularly as they move to more transactive models. Then they have to look at the aggregation of all those resources dynamically sometimes when it's called for, for load shifting, for reliability purposes. So when they look at their systems, they look at their external processes out at the grid edge, then they also have to have these core systems that they've dealt with around customers, asset management, net grid network modeling, for example, and planning. And they have to have systems that support those processes that are really characterized by flexibility to do things differently integrated so they can pull information and push information where and how and when they need to. They have to proact, they have to have systems that enable very proactive, per, per, uh, proactive processes so that they can ensure reliability while still serving those customers. And they have to do it dynamically. And that's very different for utilities. So when you boil all, all of that, uh, boil all of that, it really comes down to having very different pillars for how they look at distribution. And, and it's built on, in, in my opinion, four core things. Communicate, and this we're going to talk about today. Communication, it's the ability to connect devices, systems, and people to support the collection of, and flow of data dynamically. Visibility, so they have to accurately model a unified network from the system to the customer level. And that's what I meant by down to the individual asset and all the way across the grid. Security, something we've talked about a lot this week. They have to limit cyber vulnerability at individual asset and system levels, and also, and this is extremely important, protect customer privacy. And analysis, it's a data-driven world. Data is the currency of the grid. They have to continuously optimize business decisions, support choice, and maximize reliability using data and underpinned analytics. So the new norm for utilities, really these three things, or these four things. There's a shift in control. Customers and culture, not utilities, are driving the pace of change. Utilities are very used to being able to plot things very methodically and move forward in a very cautious manner. Customers are changing all of that. Culture is changing all of that. They're simply demanding different things of utilities. There's very complex definitions of what value is to those consumers. You know, it, the whole idea of having reliable energy and delivering it cheaply is never gonna go away. But the value, how people value that is gonna be very different. They're gonna blend what they, they believe are values. Those are those new segments that I talked about. Some people are, perfectly okay with paying more for greener energy. That's a different dynamic for utility. So when you look at, at the idea of individual assets and also aggregated assets, that means that your network model, how you manage your grid is shifting from real time, it's shifting to real time, two way and exception based. And that's all of the systems and devices will need to support that orientation. And that calls into uh, you know, question some traditional systems like SCADA, which really weren't designed to do that. And this, I think, applies to every industry that we've, we've come across uh, in our conversations this week. Innovation is just beginning. It will never, ever again be this slow. And if you go back to Beth's comment, that means that we just need to buckle in and figure out ways to do things better. 
So the, the, I'd like to introduce uh, somebody I've mentioned already, Dwayne Bradley, he's a, in the technology, he's a technology development, development manager in the Emerging Technology Office at Duke Energy. Uh, he's gonna come up here and, and walk us through what o Open FMB is and, and uh, what Duke is doing and why. Then we'll be joined uh, after that by David Lawrence, also in the technology, um, Emerging Technology Office at Duke Energy. And Eddie, Lee's, uh, Eddie Lee from, from Moxa and Stuart Gillen from Spark Cognition, uh, who are, um, Moxa works with Duke um, in, communi in communications out at the grid edge. Spark Cognition does as well. They support analytics, uh, very, very advanced analytics um, for utility scale renewable integration. So thank you very much. And with that, Dwayne.